good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Dear Mabula, I know it's 9 a.m. where you are. You're joining in from, from Atlanta. Yes. And we really want to uh, welcome you to the HUMA book launch seminar series. Uh, this is a space for discussing critical work written by Africans and Africans in the diaspora about Africa. And the seminar is hosted by HUMA, the Institute for Humanities in, in Africa, which is located at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Um, there are several, several discussions or questions which we aim to engage with here, uh, mm -hmm. notably on what it means to be human today. And I'm Amina Suleimani, a doctoral research fellow. And today I'm really honored to be uh, hosting you because you, um, you've written a really critical book and you've been a critical voice uh, for the past decade. Uh, so thank you for your generosity and, and for being here. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Amina. You're welcome. I would just uh, first would like to introduce you. Uh, and then I will give you the floor to speak about the book. And later on, we'll open uh, for a Q&A with the audience and participants here with us. Um, so as a matter of intro introduction, Dr. Mabula Sumaro, you're an associate uh, professor in the English department of the University of Tours in France, where you've also received your PhD. You're a specialist in the field of Africana studies and you have conducted research and taught in several universities and prisons in the United States and France, Bennington College, Columbia University, Barnard College, Bard Prison Initiative, Stanford University, Sciences Po, the prisons in Bois d'Arcy, Villepinte, which is um, a juvenile detention, and Fresne. Professor Maro, you're the author of Le Triangle et l'Hexagone, Réflexion sur une identité noire, published in French by La Découverte and translated to English by Dr. Kiama Glover as Black is the Journey, Africana the Name, which was published very recently uh, by Polity, and which, which is the topic of our discussion today. Um, I, I wrote this little summary about what the book is about, but I think it would be it would be great to, to hear from you um, about it first, and then uh, perhaps I'll provide that summary uh, later on. Mm -hmm. um, we're really, yeah, looking forward to hear from you um, today and, and to think with you about the sort of alliances and the genealogies uh, of knowledge ancestors that you think with in this book uh, mm -hmm. and the ones that you write with uh, and think with along this journey. So I'll, I'll give you the floor and we look forward to, to hear from you. Okay. So thank you, Amina, for this introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may find yourselves in the world. Um, I need to say that I still haven't been to South Africa. So I hope that at some point in life, this Zoom era will end and I can uh, finally uh, come to South Africa because all my plans of coming to South Africa have been uh, ruined by the pandemic. So since 2020, I've, I've been supposed to come, but I'm happy uh, we're able to meet uh, via this Zoom meeting. Um, so what I can say about the book, um, so as to per perhaps contextualize it and also reflect on my recent reading in preparation of this, uh, of this Zoom meeting this morning, I decided to read the book and I hadn't read, uh, I hadn't read the book. In a, in a while, and I hadn't read it in English in a while. Um, so by reading it, um, let's say this weekend, this past weekend, and in English, I really, it really took me to reflect on, uh, on what it has meant for me to do the research that I've been doing for uh, 20 years now, and also to contribute to these, you know, diasporic intellectual conversations. It really made me realize that the, the mere act of translating the work provided by uh, Dr. Kayama Glover, uh, who is um, you know, a friend that I've known for years and also a colleague who work um, graduate students at the same time. Uh, um, I was really interested in Kayama Glover's take on my book and on the language. And I think that the issue of translation is of so much importance. Uh, for, for the matters that we're interested in, 
that it was interesting to see what had been done with this, uh, uh, with this book and what was at stake. So it was interesting to see when reading what was emphasized, what had been, what had um, to remain, uh, you know, impossible to translate, who I was talking to, how I was uh, talking to. So by reading the, the book in English, of course, there are differences between the French version and the English version, because we are not talking, we're not addressing the same audiences. So I'll begin with the original work, which was the French version. Um, what happened with this book is that uh, for, let's say, over six years, uh, I have calculated over six years, I had been obsessed with um, you know, a number of questions. I, I, I had been traveling, I mean, I had been traveling extensively, but I also had been working on the African diaspora of the Atlantic, but with a particular focus on you know, the English speaking Americas, right? That was my formal training. This is, a, I was trained an Americanist, and then I uh, specialized in um, African American studies. And only later on did I expand, that is to say, uh, came out of the United States to include the Caribbean. So Jamaica, you know, Afro-Jamaica and African-America were my sites of study. This is what I did. This is what I was trained in. Trained in. But over the years, this interest for things Black, things Africana, the Black Atlantic, really led me or perhaps helped me better understand my own Black identity and my own Black identity anchored in hexagonal France, anchored on the African continent due to my parents and my ancestry through my parents, and explore this idea of blackness in places where blackness is not so commonly discussed, right? As if black, blackness had uh, you know, deployed in the Americas that the, the, the foundation of the construction of blackness is the transatlantic slave trade, uh, the invention of blackness and, 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 and whiteness, and you know, plantation slavery in the Americas and all the things that are going on outside of my, uh, let's say my world. But the problem is that France is also part of this history and France has also participated to this colonial project, to the institutionalization of slavery, to the limitation of the slave status to particular bodies, that is to say black bodies, and that France in uh, her European part, in hexagonal France was not uh, inclined to discuss those matters uh, commonly, right? And I happen to be uh, born in France. And I happen to be the daughter of Ivorian migrants who came to, to France in the 1960s, just like many people from the post, I mean, from the post, not, not post, the former empire, right? So there was nothing particular about my family history and their move from continental Africa to uh, European metropoles. So carrying out this work on the Black Atlantic in the English speaking Black Atlantic gradually led me to uh, want to focus more on the meaning of blackness in the European context and in the French context in particular, but it took me years, right? So the other thing that I wanna point out is that I started writing this book or what was supposed to become this book when I was away. I was not in France, I was in the United States. I was at Bennington College and I had been invited for a year um, as a visiting professor. And as always happens when I'm away from France, I, I grow those obsessions about France. I want to see what's going on. I want to know what is happening when I'm, not, when I'm away. It's like France becomes even more important when I'm away from the country. And so I started thinking, I started reading, I started compiling notes that I had been accumulating over the years. And that's uh, over one year after many presentations in, in, in U.S., uh, university circles, I came back to France with maybe 30 or 40 pages written. But the thing about those pages uh, was that they were written in English. I had written them in English because I had thought about them in English and I had presented them in English through, uh, you know, different 
invitations. So when I met up with my publisher, uh, who was asking me for something to submit, I said, oh, yes, I've been working on this uh, on this project and I think that I want to continue it and here are the pages. So the publisher read the pages and uh, because he could read English and he said, yes, that, that, that looks interesting. I want you to continue, but, but you have to write in French. And that posed me a real problem. I couldn't, I didn't know uh, how to write this in, in French, which made me think, you know, this is ridiculous. You, you're not going to find somebody to translate yourself in French. You can speak French and obviously you can speak English. So, you know, what's the thing about being blocked and not being able to, you know, write about these things to utter those things in French? So after a while, we had a discussion with my publisher and he, he was of a, a great help to me because he said, okay, why don't you write about the reasons why you can't write this in French? Try to write a text explaining to yourself or at least uh, reflecting on why this is so much to ask to be able to um, you know, articulate those things in French. And that's really what helped me to, you know, um, let's say, to translate myself and to transition to the French language. And that really ended up in the introduction to the book. What I found out when reflecting about this is that it was, or I had been used to evolving in an environment where racial matters were hardly discussed. We, we, we have, of course we have words, but it is not common to discuss those matters publicly. It is not common to discuss those matters um, you know, intellectually, to write, to openly speak about. We have, we talk about them all the time, but in nuanced ways, not, not directly. And it also brought me back to my own, I mean, this reflection brought me back to my own, you know, relationship to France and the French language and, uh, you know, the loss of a mother tongue. You know, I don't speak the same language as my mother and, and, and France is not my mother, right? So what do you do with that? And, and why did I had um, why did I find such a refuge? Why did I escape to the English language that I studied, that I acquired, uh, that allowed me to travel, to study, to teach in the States and other places, and that also allowed me to think those racial matters? Because my training had been mostly in the United States, so there were lots of things that I read in English that really uh, contributed to my, to my academic training, and that had come in English. So um, I've given this, this whole introduction to say that the, the very act of writing uh, this book in French, but also located within France and within hexagonal France was really, um, let's say, the arrival point of a journey that had begun years ago, that had begun 20 years ago academically, and that had begun many years before because of the family history and, and, and the displacement and, and migration of my own parents. So I think that um, when I, I wrote this book, it was in 2019, I really was taking stock. I really was reflecting on these years that I had been um, you know, traveling between France and the Americas, not only the US and the African continent. And I was trying to use those experiences. I was trying to use uh, the academic training, the research that had been conducted over the years to explain my own life, to explain to myself my own life and uh, the life and the trajectory of my family. So the book is not so much an autobiography. It is really an attempt at making sense of one's, let's say, individual trajectory in light of the collective uh, trajectories, in light of the collective history uh, that has been, uh, you know, designated the African diaspora. So the goal was to, um, I don't know, strike a balance, you know, between the individual and the collective. You tell your own story, but you are aware, deeply aware that your story is not, um, ha your story has um, its own particularities, but your story is only, um, you know, one illustration on one or one example of all the people who are, a part of what we call this African diaspora, whether it's, it is the, the, the diaspora that was um, created or that is founded 
on the, you know, the transatlantic safe trade or the diaspora that continues to this day through different waves of migration um, that are triggered by, you know, uh, different conditions and circumstances, right? So if my parents came to France as part of the post-colonial migration wave uh, of the 1960s or the post-Second World War, uh, being a Black person, being of African descent, I can still find uh, connections. I can still share with Black people from um, across the Atlantic. Um, I don't know, I can still forge a racial solidarity. We still carry, we can still carry the same body, that is to say a body that has been shaped by history, bodies that have been constructed as Black, and therefore bodies that uh, get read a particular way in the world, whether one talks about the Americas, uh, the European continent, or the African continent, right? So this is really what the Black is the journey, uh, Africana is the name, um, uh, about it's an exploration. Um, I, I would say firstly addressed to hexagonal friends, uh, trying to present um, a talking, a taking stock of um, you know the genealogy, the intellectual and political, even you know religious or spiritual traditions that have explored these issues. Uh, related to blackness over the centuries. And I think that the time has arrived for hexagonal friends. Uh, I make the clear distinction between hexagonal friends and the territories that are called the, ter the, the overseas, ter overseas territories, right? I'm, I'm really speaking from, um, uh, you know, from hexagonal friends. I was born in Paris and I, and I live in, in hexagonal friends. So the discussion there um, is, has really been about erasing, forgetting, minimizing or silencing those issues and that history. So I was really talking to myself at first and then, you know, the larger society to say, no, we need to look at these, um, at these things because there are black people in France, just like there are black people in Europe and in other places. And these, these black people have an experience that is not uh, similar, that has its own nuances and that should not be mistaken. Um, with the, the Black experiences of other locations in the world. Europe is not Africa, that is not the Americas. And let's talk about that, let's study that, and let's, let's come out, right? Let's come out. So this is what I can say about the book, Amina. Thank you so much, dear Mabula. I think you, you brought a lot of thematics and themes, which, which I have been curious to ask you about, especially the, the question on translation. Uh, mm. The French title is about geometric shapes, the triangle et l'hexagone, and the English one is Black is the Journey, Africana is the name. And I was, I was wondering about the dimensions uh, of spaces or thoughts that you wish to transmit for both. I know you kind of answered this question by saying, you know, there, there are two different, I mean, there are multiple audiences for each. Um, yeah. But what was the thinking process behind the English title versus the French one? Okay, so interesting. So a few things I can say about the, the French title first. I thought, I think that before I wrote, the title had come to me. I had chosen and I was, uh, you know, set on le triangle et, et, et l'hexagone, the triangle and the, um, and the hexagon. And it was interesting because for the French publisher, uh, the hexagon was, was clear. Right, they said we can understand the hexagon, and the hexagon is a common way in French to designate the French Republic. Right, you are taught in school that uh, in geography class that France is supposed to be a, a hexagon. Right, six uh, sides, uh, ge uh, geometric figure. Uh, so people often, oftentimes, call France the hexagon with a capital H. So that was clear. What seemed to be unclear for the publishing house was, was the triangle. They were worried about the difficulty to understand what the triangle could be about, right? For the potential readers. So they said, uh, you know, they, they were not too happy about my title, <laughs> but I was determined to keep that title. And, and my idea behind that, by imposing that title was that if France is not familiar with the triangle, 
this is this is exactly the reason why I want to include triangle in the in the book because designating France as a hexagon really cuts France off from other parts of her geography, right? Uh, particularly the territories that are called the overseas territories. And those overseas territories, the ones that exist to this day, are the locations that bring us back to the colonial history, to the history of slavery. So if you cut off France uh, from them, then you can erase and you can silence that history. And that's precisely what I did not want to do. And I'm talking only about the current overseas territories. We are not even uh, get, um, taking into account the former colonial empire, right? That is to say, all the places that have gained their independence since, let's say, the, 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 the late 1950s, from the late 1950s on, right? So I'm not even worrying about, uh, you know, the African continent or Asia. I'm, I'm only talking about, you know, Guyana, uh, French Guyana, um, Martinique, Guadeloupe, the Reunion Islands, even though I'm focusing on the Atlantic world, so I'm not dealing so much with the Indian Ocean or the Pacific Ocean, right? Um, so I insisted on the Triangle de l'Hexagone, and that was my way uh, very early on to ground this national narrative into a larger narrative and, and into a larger geography. To get to this larger narrative, you needed to expand the geography. So that was my thing. So the compromise that we agreed upon was that there was going to be a subtitle. I was going to keep Le Triangle et l'Hexagone, and then the subtitle was uh, Reflexion sur une identité noire, Reflections on a Black identity, not the Black identity, but a Black identity. Because as I said in my introduction, it really was about using my own experience as a legitimate source to make connections uh, with a larger history and with larger mi migrations. Okay, so that's, that's the, 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 the French part. And I, I hope I have contributed to making, uh, you know, clearer that, that, that the, you know, that France was involved in the, the, the transatlantic slave trade, which to me seems so basic and foundational, right? And then when it comes to the English title, I have to say that the, the title is mine. It's not Kayama Glover's. Like I impose, like uh, I think I'm a bit of a tyrant. And uh, because I'm, I, I can speak English, I could uh, work closely with Kayama Glover uh, um, uh, on the translation, right? This will not be the case for other languages that I don't master, but for the English uh, version, I could, I, I could do it. So I did not feel, I don't know, ready to translate my French words in English at a level that will be, I don't know, satisfying to me. Like I wanted it to be, uh, you know, produced, the, the, the narratives to be produced by an, you know, a native speaker. So this is why I trusted uh, Kayama and I trust also our scholarship. Um, and I was also interested in the exercise of translation, what it would yield in English outside of me. What would some English speaker, some uh, other person originating from the US and the Caribbean how would they understand, how would they translate? So I was interested in that um, exercise, but I was also interested in my title. So I said, the title is going to be Black is the Journey, African at the Name, because this is what, this is how it sounded in my mind. This is how, how it sounded, that the, you know, we could not play on the hexagon because, because the English speaking would not even understand what the hexagon uh, could refer to. Uh, of course, the triangle could be kept, but. But in the French title, the triangle and the hexagon work together. So if you're missing one of the components of this formula, you, you, you lose something. So I decided to go on, uh, you know, in a totally different directions and to, um, you know, focus on, on the issue or the theme, uh, um, on the theme of circulation, peregrination, trajectory, you know, journey journey of any kind, journey, a physical journey, a spiritual journey, an intellectual journey, you know, something, you know, that has to do with uh, displacement, that has to do with evolution, that has to do with change. Uh, and, and I think that the, the word journey captured 
uh, all of that. And it also le the title left room for, you know, Africana and black. So to me, that was that was the perfect combination. So it was, uh, uh, yeah, very strict on the title. <laughs> that, that's how it sounded to me. And it, it really was about um, translating, that is to say, sharing and making understandable certain things to a different you know, linguistic audience, right? And geographic audience as well. So. Thank you so much, uh, Mabula. Uh, I have lots of questions still, and I'll, I'll probably keep some of them for later because we have a question from uh, my colleague here at HUMA, Dominique. I'll yes. just ask you to unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay, Th thank you, Amina. Uh, bonjour, Mabula. I'm also, bonjour, Dominique. I'm also a French, uh, French okay. African uh, from Burkina Faso and Paris. And yeah, I was very fascinated by your explanation on the translation of your, of your titles. So, so interesting that you felt like strongly in English and in, in French about those, those titles. And for me, when I read your title in French, you know, of course I, I was thinking about the commerce triangulaire, the, the self-trade, but also of your own trajectory, you know, like from, from you know, like the African roots and, 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 and Paris and, and the US. And I was thinking about, you know, like my, my journey as well and the journey of so many other like um, black French or African French in that travel to the US and that have this common kind of also realization. I think that there's something about about the French ideology of universalism, et cetera, that, that prevent us to see mm -hmm. some of our, of our like black, <laughs> black reality uh, mm -hmm. of blackness uh, very clearly. And, and, and the, the kind of um, the shift that happened when we, we are in the US kind of, or in, in Brazil or in other, in other places in the Americas, just mm -hmm. like uh, <laughs> awake something. And mm -hmm. as you know, I'm not going to, I know that you're very aware of that, but in France, in the, the um, current debate, there's a lot of like uh, um, effort to, to, to make the Americanization some, something very evil and, <laughs> and illegitimate, yes. right? Yes, so, yes. so like, what would you, how would you like, um, explain <laughs> like why it's important like to consider like the legitimacy of this revelation and shift of our identities mm. like it's not it's not about an influence it's not about the soft power yeah. of the yeah. us it's about something that is awakened in us when we yes. are displaced in another context so yes if you could like address address this thank issue you. thank you dominique for your very difficult question <laughs> thank you for bringing complexity I think this is a, a difficult question, but it is also uh, an important question. Um, when the French, I'll give a, perhaps um, a contextualization for, for, for the others uh, online who might not be familiar with the French context. Um, you know, the French have been, um, how can I say, saying that, that France is at the moment or has, um, you know, lately been contaminated polluted by ideologies, uh, you know, intellectual trends, political trends that come to the United States. And that some people in the French context, in the hexagonal French context, try to impose on the French Republic, on French society, theories that can only work in the United States context, right? That's a general, um, you know, uh, discussion, a public discussion that is taking place now. So, to begin with that, that argument, first I need to say that this argument reflects um, you know, a deep ignorance of US academia, right? This uh, overgeneralizing presentation and understanding of US academia as being you know, deeply, inherently only American shows that the people who are talking about this have not set foot on you know, campuses in the United States, because as we know, due to different reasons that we won't have time to explore here, but US academia has had the power, the economic power, and also the you know, sufficient pr prestige to attract to its rank, um, you know, to its ranks, many scholars from across the world. 
So people who are, uh, you know, like scholars from Nigeria, from India, from the Caribbean, from Latin America, from Europe can pursue their careers in US academia. So what does that mean? Does that mean that when those people migrate to the United States, when they are appointed in positions that allow them to pursue you know, their, their academic interest, do they all of a sudden become Americans? And do they become the representative of a US state of mind or a US you know, uh, intellectual tradition? That doesn't make any sense. When I went to the United States, I studied with Americans, yes. I studied with people from Britain, from Jamaica, from Nigeria, uh, and from the French Caribbean. That's just a fact. But all these people held positions, academic positions in the United States. So were they all Americans? We could think about that and we could ref reflect on that. And, and the, the second um, point, Dominique, is that of, uh, you know, why does it matter? Why is it important? to say those things from friends and from hexagonal friends today. I think it matters because we exist. It matters because we have no other choice. It's what do you make one of the, you know, deeper question, existential question even is that, of, you know, what do we make of our own experiences? What do we make of our own, you know, presence on French soil? Not because we want to be French, I keep saying that, not because we, you know, we love France, just because we exist. And as human beings and as academics, I think we have a legitimate right to tackle those issues because we cannot be stuck between, you know, like uh, blackness being widely and freely discussed in the US or the rest of the Americas and Africanness and another form of blackness, um, you know, uh, that constitute the identity of our parents. The fact is that our parents moved from the African continent to Europe and we were born or we grew up or we currently live, live and reside on European soil. So we have to be able to express our own blackness our own identity, our own Frenchness, if we want to, whatever it is. But to me, it really, it's really about making sense of your own existence, whether it be individual or collective. You're not, uh, you know, like, um, you're not isolated. It's not only you, it's actually a lot of people. And that presence is closely, um, I mean, takes us back to a particular history. So let's get into that. It's, it's not a coincidence. It's not by pure chance. There are a lot of people who come from those uh, conditions and circumstances. So I think just because of that, we have the right to uh, deal with those issues as legitimate issues because they encompass you know, communities uh, you know, and individuals. I think that's enough. As long as it exists, then it can be studied. All the things that exist can be studied. So I hope I've uh, replied to uh, your question. Yeah, thank you, merci. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you, Mahula. And, you know, in, in thinking about the book and also a concept which, not a concept, a reality which, which you've mentioned, which is about silence in histories, um, I always, like to think with the Haitian anthropologist, uh, Michel Rovetrouillot, and he has this quote, um, which says, history is the fruit of power, but power itself is never so transparent that its analysis becomes superfluous. The ultimate mark of power may be its invisibility, the ultimate challenge, the exposure, the exposition of its roots. And, and I sort of, struggle with thinking about how do we expose the roots uh, and is there an, are the roots infinite uh, in some ways? And I, I wanted to ask you whether you reckon that this ultimate challenge of exposing the roots is an everlasting fight or will it be possible to arrive to a point where we've said, where we'll be, we'll be able to say everything has been said, all the atrocities have become visible but where do we go now? Mm. Wow. 
I, I don't know, and I don't think that this is a show of uh, pessimism. I, I don't think that we'll, we, we will ever reach a point where uh, we can say everything has been said, because there will always be something to be said as long as people are alive. So if everything has been said, um, it means that people, that everybody's dead, that this is the end of the world. You know, just like when we make the, you know, the distinction between, um, you know, languages that are still spoken and dead languages, right? The dead languages are languages coming from uh, communities or locations where nobody, um, continues to speak that language. And if nobody continues to speak it, uh, to speak that language, it means that the, that language is set. It's no longer evolving. There are no new words. There are no new, um, I don't know, new phrases, new way to look at things. And the, em the emergence and surfacing of new words and new phrases in any language is due to new experiences. So this is why in their evolutions, languages gain new words, but also lose new words, right? Because things evolve. Uh, if you don't, I don't know, if an activity, for instance, is no longer part of, of the group or of the society of the community, uh, the community then the verb of, you know, like um, um, designating the practice of that activity will disappear because the action no longer exists. Right? If you think of Edouard Glissant in the, le, the, the Caribbean discourse, le, le discours en tille, tille, he talks about all those words that have disappeared from the Martinican Creole because the activities, he talks about fishing, for instance, or, or, or sometimes uh, craftsmen, certain things that they don't do. So they, since the, the practice no longer exists, the utterance of the practice can no longer exist. Right? But I'm insisting on the gains and the losses, and that is life, right? This is, you know, you know life and, and death. So for us to, to say or to hope that everything will have been said eventually, um, to me, that doesn't seem possible because as long as we are alive, there will be things to say. But what matters is really, and what is, remains of, import, of importance is to be able to say, clearly what has been what, what has happened in the past this we can do but that you know focusing on the past uh, will not stop us from continue from continuing to live so there will be other things and there will be more layers and more complexities and more you, you know and and that's it and that's fine what i'm interested in is you know <laughs> You know what you read about Trouillot, that this quote and, and, and all this work uh, by Trouillot is really, um, you know, reflection of power and, and, and power could be replaced by whiteness, you know, the invisibility, um, the silence, the, the privilege of, um, of normality, of normalcy, mm -hmm. you, you know, that, that's the same. Um, so I think it, it's important to, um, again, to take stock of the past, to talk freely about the past, to reflect on the past so that we can move on and we can continue with our lives. And, 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 and then there will be things to say about the year 2021, you know, in, uh, I don't know, 200 years or 3000 years. I don't know. So we'll, uh, I don't know if we can ever say everything, but we can surely say lots of things about the past. Definitely. So I can see my light is, uh, I don't know why I'm having so much difficulty about the light today. I think this is slightly, yeah, this is better. Thank you. <laughs> um, there's a question from Liteko. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I was just also thinking about, uh, Liteko, please do ask your question uh, just now, but I just also wanted to ask you, Mabula, if you could also speak to perhaps what did you not include in the book? Um, what were you not able to, to add or to 
to mm -hmm. to write um that's, that, that's a very oh my god this is a very deep question i mean i thank you what i did not include in the book definitely there are many things but is africa and the ivory coast this is the least explored location of the triangle because this is the because with the Ivory Coast, with Africa, I'm really getting into the intimate and I was not ready. I hope to be uh, ready <laughs> soon, but um, it's one thing, you know, like to, um, there are some distance that you can maintain with your object of study. It's, it, it, as I explained at the beginning, it is, there is something convenient about studying African-Americans at first and Afro-Jamaicans. And even, even if you're black, it's still not your people. It can be you know, your people um, you know, symbolically, but it's not your family. It's not your mother. It's not your father. It's not your sisters and brothers. They can be other uh, forms of mother, father, sisters, and brothers, but it, 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 it's not you, right? So you're really getting into blackness, but you, you, you maintain some form of safe distance. When I go to the African continent, not the entire continent, of course, because I'm, I can freely go to uh, you know, Senegal and, and, and Nigeria and other places that I've visited, but the Ivory Coast is still troubled to me. It's still blurry. It's still, uh, there's an emotion there. And, and, and let's say there's no safe distance so I think that uh, when rereading the book, uh, but very early on when I completed the book, it became very um, obvious that, that the Ivory Coast was, uh, had been neglected. It had been neglected. So I have to catch up. I don't know, I have to make my peace, do stuff, but uh, it's, it's intimate. So that, that's one thing that comes to mind immediately. I can talk about France, I can talk about the US, I can talk about, um, I don't talk so much about, uh, about the Caribbean, but it's part of the Americas that I am interested in. But um, it would be one thing to, to talk about the African continent in general and what, what it means to be black or what it means to be you know, also European and French when going back to the African continent, but it would be something totally different to deal with uh, the Ivory Coast because it, it's mine. It's mine somehow, so it's difficult, but I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm working on it. And the fact also is that I haven't been too many times uh, in the Ivory Coast. I was supposed to go uh, at the beginning of the year, I think, after, after 20 years, I was supposed to go, but pandemic, you know, so once I make it to Abidjan, I'll make it to Cape Town and I'll, you know, I'll catch up on all the things I'm supposed to do. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's been 20 years now. So it's a different story. I think it's, a, it would be another form of scholarship. And that would be, um, you know, like a, a tighter mix of, of, of scholarship and, and, and and I don't know, autobiography or something like that. It's, you know, like, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you home. so much. Yeah, I mean, we would love to, to have you in Cape Town once you've passed or Abidjan to just, yeah, hear your thoughts on. I'll, I'll, I'll remind you that, Amina. I'll say you said that <laughs> I was going to come to Cape Town. <laughs> I'll make sure not to forget. <laughs> yeah, no, don't worry. I'll make it to Cape Town at some point. Yes, uh, we'd love to have you. And um, Liteko, could you please unmute yourself to ask your question? Okay, by now my, my mind is now more messed up than it was when I first raised the hand, but I'll try to put it back. <laughs> which is good, but, Liteko, which is good. We won't confuse mine so that we okay. can, we can yeah. work through them and we can, that's the thing. We, we don't want nothing easy. Nothing is easy. Of course, of course, Prof. Thank you very much uh, you know, uh, for your contributions. And we look forward really to uh, going into, diving into uh, your thought in, in, the, in the book. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry that I arrived a little late, 
Uh, yeah. But I find it interesting that your title says uh, Black is the journey and Africa is the name. And for yeah. many of us um, in South Africa, particularly uh, from a uh, particularly insistently Black and leftist, you know, um, uh, you know uh, a kind of politics, Blackness has always been at the center of, uh, you know, uh, thinking about the future and dealing with the present of, you know, political challenges during and after apartheid. So when blackness becomes a journey, then um, the question uh, becomes, are you, are you using this uh, as, uh, are you engaging black consciousness in any way? Is this something that would be seen as uh, a purpose to, or as, as resonating with Biko's politics, uh, mm -hmm. to Biko's politics about, you know, um, a black identity as a political identity being the answer to uh, basically white supremacy, mm -hmm. uh, then in the form of apartheid, but again in in, in other contexts, in other forms come you know come into view. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and the question that was asked about uh, the by by um, Amina Suleimani um, about when is this going to end, you know, uh, these, these struggles, you know, to end racism and stuff. So for me, the question becomes today where we are at right now, and uh, perhaps also where the generations that have come before us were at, is it more the question of, are we ending this racism or are we negotiating ourselves around it? Are we, are we um, accepting that we are so integrated in um, a society uh, that is uh, predominantly white, you know, mm -hmm. um, in its values across the globe, such that uh, our possibilities of, 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 of erasing racism uh, have, have uh, become more <laughs> impossible. Like we, we, we no longer, that, that possibility has, 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 mm -hmm. has, has gone away, you know, um, or it's, it's increasingly being lost, you know. Um, than having to live with it and dealing with it um, as it comes, you know, in the everyday, whether in the form of microaggressions, whether in the form of a bigger structure, uh, you know, what, what is the book? Is the book addressing that? Um, and, and, and how, how is it dealing with it? Um, and, and thirdly and lastly, uh, I see that there is an emphasis of diaspora here where Africana itself is the name. Um, so, can you explain that, you know, uh, because I'm, I'm thinking here, what if the diaspora itself is a privilege of those who are able to not only to travel, but to access the world uh, in, in a much more expansive, you know, broad, you know, uh, a, a way than most people wouldn't be able to do, whether they are in, you know, um, Abidjan, whether mm -hmm. they are in Johannesburg, whether they are in, mm -hmm. in Nairobi, you know. Yeah. yeah, those would be just my question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, your questions, Biteko. Um, I'll begin with the first one in Black consciousness and Biko. So I'm not a specialist of, of South um, you know, Africa. I'm not a specialist of Biko. I am aware about you know, Black consciousness, but this is not something that I you know, theoretically engaged with in the book. That, that's, that, that's not my field. But I am aware of the, you know, like the reflections and the theory uh, produced out of South Africa in the, the context of apartheid, but it's not something that I, um, um, that I academically, let's say that in, uh, you know, scholarly I, I deal with in, in, in the book, right? Uh, it's just a, a different matter of, it's a different, um, it's a matter of different areas, geographic areas, and, and it can be, uh, of course, discussed, and I could easily have included uh, Biko, but I, I just didn't. So that, that that's for the first question. And then the thing about you know the you know racism and the fight against racism and and where are we today and are we integrating or are we? I think I think we should not forget that progress has been made, um, that challenges remain, of course. And I, and I think that the challenges, this is what I was telling Amina earlier. Um, I don't think it's, it's, it's a show of pessimism to say that, but the challenges will remain until the end of the world because human beings are human beings. Um, but the apartheid that you mentioned, at least 
legally, I'm not saying that this is perfect, no longer exists. And people have fought for that. And people have given their life for that. It's, it's the, the, uh, the end of apartheid hasn't, of course, um, solved everything in, uh, in South Africa, just like the abolition of slavery did not solve everything for you know, former slaves anywhere, any place, uh, at any time in the history of the, um, uh, you know, the transatlantic slave trade. Whether one talks about you know, the UK, the United States, Brazil, Argentina, whatever, the abolition of slavery was just the abolition of slavery. Just like at some point, I mean, the abolition of slavery was preceded by the abolition of the slave trade, right? The slave trade and the, and the institution of slavery were never abolished at the same time in any location of, of this Black Atlantic that I'm interested in. You see what I mean? So now uh, perhaps, the, um, how can I say? The disillusion is, to, is, is about finding out that toppling one thing or toppling one aspect of the global system is not gonna topple the entire system. And that the, you know, like the, 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 the struggles for freedom and the struggles for the end of racism are never ending, never, never ending. There will be, uh, you know, and there have been different ways. Um, you know, I'm thinking about Angela Davis and one of her latest books that is entitled, um, Freedom is a Constant Struggle. It never ends. Uh, the end of Jim Crow and racial segregation in the United States did not uh, um, solve all the problems of the United States in the North or in the South or in the West. Today in the early 21st century, we're talking about Black Lives Matter. So it means that obviously in the 1950s and 1960s, not everything has been taken care of. But at least I think that even though problems persist, issues persist, we should not be blind to the progress that still has been achieved. Slavery does not no longer exist in that particular form. I can agree that there are you know, other forms of enslavement. And of course that domination, I mean dominance in, in, in general continues to exist, but it has to morph and that's the danger. It morphs and it, um, you know, weighs on people in different manners. And this is why the struggle is continuous. But forms of oppressions, whether one talk about the uh, apartheid, uh, you know, the slave trade or, 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 or slavery, they, they have disappeared. And that needs to be taken into account because people have given their life for that. So that would be my question. Uh, my answer to your question. And about the third question regarding the diaspora, I beg to disagree a little. There are different ways to look at diaspora. I understand what you're saying about the privileged diaspora and um, the privileged diaspora, particularly due to the power of free movement, right? The people who can travel and who can travel the world with the right passports, right? With the powerful passports that allows you to cross borders. That's one thing. And I agree with you, but then you can also look at diaspora as a fact. And this has nothing to do with privilege, given the fact that at least in social sciences, when you look at, when you look at diasporas in general, and my interest being the African diaspora, you are looking at the scattering of people and the original scattering that took place in the modern era was that of the enslaved Africans who were scattered outside of the African continent. I mean, first within the African continent and then outside of the African continent in the context of the transatlantic slave trade. How privileged was that movement? If we look at the basic rules of the definition, right, academically of diaspora, a diaspora begins with a disaster, a, a catastrophe, right? It can be a war, a conflict, a natural disaster that forces a community or, or, or several communities 
to leave their place of origin and to be scattered in at least two different locations. It's not one group leaving because of, of whatever reason, one point uh, from point A to go to point B. It, there needs to be a point A and there needs to be point B and C at least and D, E, whatever you want, right? So this scattering creates a sense of loss, a sense of nostalgia, a sense of fantasy, a sense of idealization of the lost place, right? Connections need to be maintained between the various scattered communities, point A and point B. They need to be aware that some members of their community live in other places. And there needs to be some form of connection maintained with the place of origin, of origin that has been lost. This is how diaspora, um, you know, um, diasporas uh, are constituted. So I think that they don't necessarily have something to do with privilege. Diasporas can be a matter of fact, it's just the scattering of people and commun communities. What I think you had in mind, Diteko, was, you know, like the perhaps, um, I don't know, educated, scholarly, intellectual or political diaspora that is perhaps more, you know, aware and conscious of the sol solidarities that need to be forged and maintained, right? But, but it, those do not erase the people who find themselves in diaspora and that have not asked for it. And they might not be consciously, um, I don't know, they might not be consciously, um, you know, practicing this, this diaspora, but they're still cooking rice and peas, right? They're still braiding, uh, you know, the hair of their little girls a particular way. They're still maintaining or, you know, transmitting, passing down, you know, languages, folk tale. They're still dressing a particular way. And that, that, that is the diaspora, the matter of fact diaspora. So I don't know if I was clear in the distinction that, uh, that I was trying to make. You take off, just let me know. Can I come in there? Uh, okay, through you, Chair. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, explanation. Um, mm. And I think I do agree with you and understand even better your use of the diaspora. So basically, it, 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 just to make sure that I understand you fully, you mm. are using a, the, a, a, a diasporic poetics of freedom here. Uh, basically, that's that's where your argument about freedom is located. I'm not sure because I obviously have not read the book. So, so uh, please help me here. Um, are you imagining freedom in relation to diasporic communities as both a condition, uh, you know, um, that that uh, define you know life in the diaspora, but also as the answer to how to deal with the global problem of structural racism and you know lack of freedom and stuff. And if that is the case, how do you then think of freedom outside of these uh, diasporic poetics? That will be my last, you know, uh, you know, uh, question. Yeah. To me, so I don't know if I'm clear about how I understand your your last question, but to me, freedom is the goal. Yeah. Freedom is the goal. Diaspora or not diaspora, freedom is the goal. And I think that um, one thing that I should have perhaps mentioned from the get go is that in the theory of Africana studies. In the theory of this African or black diaspora, um, one of the fundamental principles is the defiance for national borders. The, the diaspora is in total contradiction with the model of the nation states. Within diaspora, South Africa, France, the United, we, that, do, does, do not matter. It's, it's not so much, the, the, the solidarity is supposed to transcend, uh, to move freely through those nation states. That's the theory. We know that for the people, right? Everyday people, passports do exist and nation states uh, actually exist, right? But the diaspora, Uh, 
um, is larger than those um, is larger than those nation states. I don't know if it adds any clarification, Miteko. It does, my sister. Thank you, and sorry for my for for um, taking over so much. <laughs> oh no! I mean, that's why we're here. We're here Thanks. to talk and exchange, so <laughs> no problem. That's why we're meeting today. Thank you, Liteko, and, and thank you, dear Mabula. If um, I know we've passed uh, the mark of 5 p.m. South African time, uh, and I would just like to ask any of the participants here if you have any final questions for Prof. Suma Ho. Um, I still had one, uh, and yeah. <laughs> I would love to ask it before we wrap up. And it's, it's actually very much related to what you've said earlier uh, and um, Dom's question on what's happening in France. And I'm thinking about Morocco, which is where I'm from, mm. where as a former French colony, the myth of color blindness also exists here. People are not able to um, say black Moroccans and to continue to say, you know, we're all equal, there's no racism. And again, that the conversation is being important imported from from the united states and my question to you is very much about you know praxis and activism and what kind of what kind of actions and what kind of praxis should exist to undo this proliferation that aims to like cancel out this debate uh, or the proliferation of arguments um which want to continue this silencing of of the question of race mm. So I think I'm not so much of a practical person, uh, Amina. So I think every every action matters, every, everything. Um, you know, dignity. Um, you know, I don't know, clothing, dissertations, publications, songs, philosophy, religions, and spirituality. Whatever it is, matters, right? That you do as an act of resistance, conscious or unconscious your own, you know, as I was discussing with Dominique, your own existence and your own existence as free and as freed as possible, that matters, right? But um, the, the, the thing that I wanted to answer to what you just explained about the Moroccan, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I just lost track, the Moroccan experience is that yes, just like France and other places, one thing that I, one thing that I think we need to keep in mind is that the very reason why there are so many heated deb debates around those issues, right? The alleged importation of US theories and the upsetting of the normal ways of working within our respective societies. The only reason why those arguments have become or have fueled those public conversations is precisely because this normalcy is being um, unsettled. Those debates used to not take place. They were not public debates because the, uh, the way societies operated was so, I don't know, taken for granted, right? I'm not saying that there was no resistance. There has always been resistance, but the resistance was so non-threatening that it did not create a public debate. So the paradox today in any of the societies that we have mentioned, the paradox today is that the violence, right? And the will to impose the old order are such that of course they are scary and of course they cause uh, you know, negative situations, but they can also be read as the reaction to the growing power of the resistance. Otherwise they wouldn't be so panicking. They wouldn't publish all those articles. They wouldn't be voting all those laws. They wouldn't be having all those debates on national television or radio. These were used to not be public debates. So the mere fact that these are becoming um, public debates paradoxi paradoxically show the progress in pain and violence, but it's still progress. 
it's things that issues that 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 those I don't know let's say the, coming from the dominant forces did not have to address. Absolutely, they did not have to uh, you know articulate arguments to prove and show that this is from the United States. This is not. This was not. Uh, there was a total silence. So I think that the, the 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 violence of the moment has to do with the the I don't know increased power of the of the new forces. So it's a bad moment to go through, and it's a bad moment to survive, but it's it's paradoxically a good thing. And it Absolutely. also shows that the um, uh, you know the the, the dominant um, will never let go. And they will give everything they have. And right now they are giving everything they have, but it's good because uh, they, are, they are reacting and they, they are sensing the threat. They are sensing the, um, you know, the power, but they've already lost. It's, they don't know. So it's only normal that they should fight as much as they, as they feel they have to because they know exactly what, what is at stake and their world is ending. It is. It doesn't mean that it's going to be a party right away, but at least we are entering a cycle where things are, are, are being, um, you know, upset and unsettled, and that's it. it it's uh, and it's going to cost a lot. And I'm, I'm, I'm not looking at it naively. I hope I'm being clear. I'm not yes. saying that. Um, I'm just saying that we are going through a profound, a pro profound transformation, which is precisely why the hostility is so great. But the hostility would not have to be that great if the powers, um, the, the dominant class was at ease. If it was at ease, it, it would be like simply dominating. It has to defend itself. It has to reassure itself because it is under attack. So there has been more throughout history. There have been, there have been periods of more comfort for the power. Right now, it's not a comfortable time. Not a comfortable time. Absolutely not. And I mean, thank you for writing your book. I think it's quite important. It comes at a really important time, and also for translating it for Anglo-Saxon speakers, um, because it's important to understand uh, what's happening in the quote-unquote global north from a southern perspective and vice versa mm -hmm. um thank you so much prof mabula for joining us today and talking to us about uh african is black is the journey africana the name and i would just like to invite anyone here to yeah get your copy and make sure you read the book uh because it's an important one and it explores uh prof somauro's journey uh, as she said, and the thematics entangled um, in, in between. Thank you and, so much. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. No. <laughs> sorry. Um, actually, to the, today's conversation was, was quite a critical one. And tomorrow we're, we're continuing this conversation. Um, we're having the African Studies Association in Africa epistemological debates, which will be on race and gender in Africa and the diaspora with uh, Keisha Khan Peri and Awinu Okesh. So do join us tomorrow if you can as well, as we'll continue this, this conversation. And Prof. Uh, Mauro, we just have a lot of gratitude. Uh, thank you. Taking a picture of you. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us. We're very grateful. And we hope to have you in Cape Town at some point. I think that would be wonderful. Yeah in Cape Town at some point. Now, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, thank you for, you know, what you just said about the, the translation. And I hope, like, English, of course, was a, a language I wanted uh, first, but I, I would love the book to be um, translated in as many languages um, uh, as possible, because the question of borders also include the issue of linguistic borders. And there are so many things, experiences, scholarship that we don't have access to because we don't speak the language. And that is ridiculous <laughs> because simply because we don't speak a language doesn't mean that those people, community and occurrences do not exist. If you look at a country such as Brazil, in 
the Americas. Brazil is the place that uh, has received the largest number of enslaved Africans. And just because we don't speak Portuguese, we don't deal with Brazil, right? Just like um, when Niteko was asking me about black consciousness and, 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 and Steve Biko, and I'm just, and I'm answering, South Africa is not my, my it, it, it doesn't make any sense, right? Scholarly borders, linguistic borders, nation state borders, we have to go, you know, like beyond that. And, 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 and to me, that's an act of resistance. So the, the issue of language is, 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 is of uh, high importance to me. So I hope that the book can travel in as many languages uh, as possible, including Arabic, Amina. And, and, and I also wanted to say um, thank you for the invitation and thank you for organizing this institute and having those sessions and reaching out to people and inviting people and taking the time to send mails to you know wait for the replies and you know like setting times and stuff but that also matters and what you are um, you know doing for one another within this group and what you're reading about discussing that also matters it, it it's not only about um you know being um or posting as a revolutionary and i'm doing you know now everything matters everything matters if you want to be a revolutionary, be a revolutionary. If you want to read books, that's fine too. If you want to write, you can write because every dissertation matters. Every position at um, uh, a, a higher education institution matters. Uh, every syllabus matters, uh, you know, everything. So, you know, thank you for existing and, and for doing your, your, your sessions regularly. Thank you so much, Timbao Bula. I think this comes to respond to the imposter syndrome, which many of us <laughs> <laughs> tend to have. have. It never ends, the imposter syndrome. It never ends, so forget about it. It will always be here. So do with it, do despite it. It, it will, look, I don't know, the thing that I've learned over the years, I mean, is that there are certain things that simply do not end and it's okay. Mm. They just don't stop you. They don't lock you. You do without, you maroon around them. You, you, you know what I mean? But they don't end. The imposter syndrome is my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> I still write books <laughs> and I don't think the books are great and everything, but it's like, I still write and it's still there. You never feel like, oh my God, this is great. This is perfect. I've done what I wanted to do exactly. And, you know, the final product. No, that's not how, but it's better to do than not to do. Absolutely. Except imperfection. Imperfection is okay. We're supposed to be imperfect. We're human beings. We're not gods and we're not angels. So that's not even our job to be perfect. Our job is to be not that mean. <laughs> <laughs> you know so don't worry about you know i mean it what i'm saying is that it does imposter syndrome is real but overcome it and don't think it would disappear just overcome it don't let it we said earlier like the, the goal is freedom yeah the goal is freedom and know that your know that your imposter syndrome is also there's logic to it there's logic it comes from somewhere mm -hmm. So to be, I don't know, to be a woman, to be a woman academic, to be originally from North Africa, to be, you, there are lots of reasons that fuel your imposter syndrome. So if you want to be, a, um, to me, the, the ultimate act of rebellion, of resistance is freedom. Mm. Just be, despite what you are being told that you cannot be. Thank you so much. I, I, I'm definitely writing this down and I'm going to put it up. <laughs> Just be, that, that's the victory. Just be, despite what, like the people like you, whatever the you is supposed to mean, whatever category was created, you're not, people like you don't do this. The, 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 the victory is to, to do whatever you want to do, not to prove. I'm not saying not to prove anything. Just to own the things that you want to do mm. and that defy those categories. You, you know what I mean? 
It, it's yeah. not like I want to prove that I'm no, that I'm good enough. No, I wanted to do this because I have this in my heart or in my mind. And apparently people like me don't do this. No, no, I'm gonna do it because I wanna do it, that's it. And that's an act of resistance. And then if you wanna be like, uh, I don't know, scholarly or political about it and saying, you know, I'm going to build institutions that are going to guarantee that people can do all the better. But that, that individual self-realization also matters. I'm very, um, I have my issues with um, pretending and postures, like I think keeping things real. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> even if it's at the micro level, it matters. Instead of uh, presenting as something grand and, and being hollow. That's me. Mm. Okay. Yes, thank you so much. We're Can I continue with my day now? <laughs> yes, have a nice day. It's ending for us, but uh, do have a nice day. And I hope we can keep in touch and yes, have you, you have you my know. info. And uh, I'm, I'm away like until February, but then I'll be back in front. So you know me, we know each other. I know all of you. At least the people I have spoken with. So Dominique, Viteko. And yeah, you have my contact information. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Mabula, again, for your generosity. and. Have a good Thank day. Thank you, Amina. Thank, Thank you, you Dominique. Thank you, Luca, Stephen, Azar. And I think, yeah, we take over. Bye bye.